Well, we are in hour 21 of learning the Bible in 24 hours. And in this particular hour, we've set this hour aside to summarize eschatology. Eschatology is the study of last things. Now, we haven't tried to segment other aspects of the theological side of biblical studies. However, the, es- the, the field of eschatology has deserves some special mention for two reasons. First of all, the study of eschatology will test your hermeneutics. Your views about the end times will derive from your theory of, of uh, interpretation. Your hermeneutics is your theory of interpretation. Some people have very strict hermeneutic, that is they have a very high view of the scripture, they take it very literally. Others take it very softly, they're willing to allegorize and take things a little softer. Depending on your attitudes about that, that'll determine where you come out on some of these controversial areas. And the second reason eschatology is so important is not not just because it's controversial, but because there seems to be a widespread belief among many of us that we're being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history. And so eschatology is no longer academic, it's very practical. Now if you take the classical divisions of theology, um, there are even different seminaries pretty much categorize theology in these, in, in these uh, partitions, if you will. The study of the Bible itself, they call bibliology. The attributes of God, that's theology property, proper. The uh, study of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself is called Christology. The study of the Holy Spirit, pneumatology. Um, angelology covers that field, not just regular angels, but fallen angels, demons, all of that falls into that category. Anthropology is their term for the study of man. Soteriology is the study of salvation. Ecclesiology, the study of the church. And I think many of the controversies in eschatology really are issues of ecclesiology. Many people are confused because they don't really understand what the church is. And of course the last, which is the one we're going to try to summarize in this hour, eschatology, the the end times, the last things. And uh, so there are two reasons at least that we want to study eschatology. It's the final test of your hermeneutics, your theory of uh, interpretation. But also it's very practical, because I do believe you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus was on the shores of Galilee. And that's a preposterous statement, and yet I challenge you to to, uh, uh, challenge that statement. You have to, to do so, you have to do two things. You have to find out what the Bible really says about these things, not what Chuck Missler or whoever, what the Bible says about these things. And the second thing you need to do then, which is a little more difficult, is find out what's going on. And you won't on the 10 o'clock news. Fortunately, thanks to the internet, thanks to the alternative press, thanks to talk radio and other things, it's now possible if you do your homework to find out what really is going on. And the more you know about your Bible and the more you know about what's really going on in the world, the more you will begin to understand why it is so many scholars are extremely excited about the horizon that we're moving into. Because what we're dealing with is the return of Christ to rule. And it's really remarkable how controversial this topic is. You wouldn't think that it would be. But there are over 1,800 references in the Old Testament uh, to the return of Christ to rule on the planet Earth. 17 books give prominence to the event in the Old Testament. There are over 318 references in the New Testament in 216 chapters. And 23 of the 27 books of the New Testament give prominence to this primary issue, the return of Christ to rule on the planet Earth. You can understand why people might not believe the Bible, might have take a different view, but it's what's astonishing to me is how many people claim to believe the Bible, claim to be Christian, and have no grasp of the idea that Christ is literally to return to inherit the promises that God gave uh, Israel and uh, throughout the Old and New Testament. For every prophecy of Christ's first coming that we all celebrate, for every one of those there are eight, seven or eight anyway, of uh, concerning His second coming. So it has far more emphasis in the Scripture than even His first coming, as dominant as that is. Now one of the things that you'll quickly discover is that most churches and many people have a view that we call amillennialism, which is essentially a word meaning they don't really believe in a literal millennium. The idea that Christ is going to return for a thousand years, as is recorded in the Scripture, many people take allegorically. Well, He's going to rule in our hearts, that sort of thing. That view is called amillennialism. And there are many different 
topics we're going to take on that are very controversial. Different people have different views. This is one that is a little disturbing to embrace because by embracing this view, in my opinion, you really are making God a liar. You're implying that the commitments that he's emphasized all through the scripture, he's not going to fulfill. There's an early church father by the name of Oregon who had a theory of interpretation, hermeneutics, that leaned on allegorization. He felt that much of the Bible wasn't to be taken literally, it was just allegories. They're nice stories for teaching purposes. And so he had a theory or an approach that involved allegorizing most of the scripture. Well, that was his, uh, his approach. But the unfortunate part was that Augustine, the uh, uh, prominent uh, person in those days, adopted his style, his approach, and he formulated out of that allegorization this view of amillennialism. Now to understand this view, you need to realize the peculiar predicament that the leaders were in in those days. They were paid by the government. Christianity had become a state religion. And can you picture a, a, a government salaried minister at a pulpit pointing out that God is going to come back to free the world from all these evil rulers and God himself is going to run things right. That didn't sell well. And uh, so in that discomfort they really adopted a style saying, well he's not going to come back literally. He's going to rule in our hearts. He's going to rule over us spiritually. And they, they find ways to, to soften that message. That, that amillennial viewpoint was the viewpoint of the medieval church and it gets codified of course in the Roman Catholic traditions. So Roman Catholic eschatology is, of course, amillennial. Then, of course, we get to the Reformation. Now, the Reformers were primarily occupied with the problems of soteriology, salvation by faith alone. They were burdened by the abuses of the church in so many of these other areas. So they did an incredible job at correcting the errors in soteriology. Salvation by faith alone was their watchword. And of course that led to the whole trauma of the Reformation in which millions were burned at the stake willingly for their commitment to that soteriology. The tragedy of the Reformation is that the fathers didn't re-examine the other areas. They maintained the same eschatology that they inherited from the medieval church. And so as a result most Protestant denominations are also amillennial in their backgrounds and they're also, they're also post-tribulational in their eschatological view, and I'll explain what that is in a moment. So you need to understand that denominationalism, whether it's Protestant or Catholic, tends to be amillennial. And there, there emerges a conflict with people who want to take the Bible seriously, who believe that God means what He says and says what He means. Amillennialism has some serious problems. Because the Bible is filled with messianic promises throughout the Old Testament that speak of Jesus taking David's throne and ruling the planet earth. You have to do something with those. Those problems are not limited to the Old Testament. When Gabriel announced the birth of Jesus to Mary, he committed to her that her child was going to sit on the throne of David. The throne of David did not exist in those days. The king in those days was appointed by Rome. He was an Edomite, an enemy of Israel. There was no David's throne. The destiny of Israel in God's covenants for Israel hang on this issue. And uh, so it's not surprising that if you're amillennial that also usually leads to anti-Semitism because there's no regard, no understanding of Israel's destiny. And of course the promise given to Mary uh, by the angel Gabriel is obviously a pivot in the New Testament. And there are numerous confirmations of these Old Testament issues in the New Testament. So this is not an Old Testament issue, it's a total Bible issue. And uh, so, so we have in eschatology, one of the first divisions that people get into as they study the Bible, they'll fall into one of two camps. They'll either take this idea of Jesus' rule on the earth as being serious and really going to happen. We would call that pre-millennial in favor of the millennium. In contrast to those who don't really believe in a literal millennium, they would call themselves amillennial. They would treat those passages allegorically or symbolically. So that's the first division. There is a group between those two that emerged for a while. Those were people that felt the millennium was already started. 
And that was pretty popular in the 17th, 18th century maybe, but as people began, began to re realize the world was in big trouble, it was pretty clear to any thinking person that we're obviously not in the millennium. I love the way Chuck Smith would summarize that viewpoint. If we're in the millennium, Satan's chain is too long. <laughs> so, so out of amillennialism there's a form of that that's getting popular again strangely called preterism. And the preterists tend to feel that all these prophecies have already been fulfilled in some way in the past. And that too is a very close cousin of amillennialism because it really means you have to allegorize all kinds of passages. And while it's popular among some leadership that's publicly visible, it is clearly not a biblically rooted point of view. There's also a group of people that are called reconstructions, uh, 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 reconstructionists or kingdom now or dominion theology. These are people who believe it's the church's job to prepare the world for the return of Christ. And it's the, it's a, it's the job of the church sort of to, to rule, take over the world and, and get it ready for Christ's return. And that may sound strange but there are an amazing number of very prominent Christians who when you really understand their point of view are really reconstructionists or, or, or kingdom now dominionists and so forth. Um, Hal Lindsey did an excellent book on this some years ago called The Road to Holocaust, because these views also will be, lead to the destruction or attempted destruction of Israel. Now the point I'm going to try to get through here as we get into this, the, your hermeneutics, your theory of interpretation will determine where you come out on these issues. If you're among those that take the Bible very seriously, you believe God means what He says and says what He means. If you tend to take it seriously, or I'll say the word literally, when, I don't like to use the word literally because when you say that to an adversary they'll say, well then you think God has feathers. Because Psalm 91, under His wings thou shalt trust. You know, the, taking it literally is not a denial of figures of speech. Obviously there's figures of speech in the Scripture. But in fact it may shock you to discover how many different kinds of figures of speech are in the Scripture. There are similes, allegories, metaphors, um, and I could go on and on. Do you know how many different kinds of figures of speech are in the Scripture? Over 200. And they are cataloged with examples in our in appendix to our book on the subject. So, But when I say literal I mean these are people that believe that in the original, not the translations, in the originals they are free of error. That God uh, superintended the Scripture to an astonishing degree. So we, from our point of view, happen to be on the right side of this, this uh, spectrum. There are many good scholars who don't necessarily go as far as we do. There are many competent scholars that are somewhere in the middle here. So I'm not here to disparage them, but uh, if you are willing to allegorize, if you don't take the text that seriously, then there are constructions you can embrace that will take you to the left side of this um, uh, spectrum. So where you come out on that will determine your eschatology in effect. Now I previously showed you the, the classical divisions of the uh, theology as taught in most seminaries uh, in America. There is a segment of theology that's missing here. There is a segment of theology that is not separated or taught in seminaries. That particular segment of theology constitutes five-sixths of the Bible, and yet is omitted as a specific focus of study. And that's the study of Israelology. Israel as an uh, instrument of God in His plan of redemption. And uh, uh, Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum got his PhD by highlighting that and demonstrating that, and his book is on Israelology is a classic in the field. And uh, the great tragedy of many Christians is they have no grasp of the Old Testament, in terms of its foundation for the new, and they have no grasp of Israel's role in the future, not just the past. And so that's one of the things we want to be sensitive to. One of the byproducts of millennialism is confusion between the role of Israel and the church. I encourage you as you study your Bible is to be sensitive to the possibilities at least that Israel and the church are distinctly different they have different origins, they actually have different missions, and they certainly have different destinies. And uh, I think being sensitive to that will clear up a lot of confusion. 
This idea that Israel has been replaced by the church is what's sometimes called replacement theology. Many, many prominent publicly uh, uh, high-profile people are actu actually come from a replacement theology point of view. As a result, they do not regard Israel as having any special place in God's future. The problem with that viewpoint is that it makes God a liar. Because as you read the Old Testament and the New, God repeatedly hammers away on this issue. In fact, Paul spends three chapters in his definitive statement of Christian gospel called the book of Romans, hammering away on this very theme. Now the other aspect of this issue of replacement theology is it lays the basis for anti-Semitism. You can actually write a very competent essay from Augustine to Auschwitz that the amillennialism led to the Holocaust in Germany. If you want to lay the blame for the Holocaust at someone's feet, don't overlook laying it to the feet of the pastors who were silent and did not discourage, in fact encouraged, um, the, uh, the, some of the abuses that led to the uh, Holocaust in, in Germany. Why is this important? Because it's going to happen again. It's going to happen again. Um, when we study the 70 weeks in Daniel, I want to remind you that the 70 weeks were specifically addressed to Israel, not the church. And that's a very important distinction that many scholars overlook. If you study Paul's epistles, you'll notice that this period during which that Paul divides the work people into three categories, Jews, Gentiles, and the church. And he makes that point several times in his epistles. And it will not always be so, and I'll come back to that when we get further in the Revelation. Because you're going to discover that from chapter 4 on in the book of Revelation, these distinctives between Jews and Gentiles reappear on the horizon. During the church, Paul emphasizes the unity of the body of Christ. But from chapter 4 on, you're going to discover there's an astonishing uh, distinction made between uh, Jews and non-Jews in, in the book from chapter 4 through 19. And we'll deal with that when we get there. Now the other topic that comes up in eschatology is this whole concept that's called the rapture. You hear people talk about the rapture. And the skeptics will say the word rapture does not appear in the Bible. Yes, it does in the Latin Bible, in the Vulgate. It comes from, the word in the Greek text is the harpazo, which is a word meaning to be snatched up forcibly. The great snatch is one way you could call it. When the Greek was translated into Latin, the word is rapturo, and the word rapture is a derivative from, is an English adaptation of the Latin Vulgate. But the word does occur, but if you want to split hairs, the word is harpazo in the Greek. This is unquestionably the most preposterous belief in Christianity. The idea that at some time, at the snap of the finger so to speak, all the true believers in Christ are going to be snatched out of the world bodily, immediately, suddenly. That sounds absolutely zany. That sounds crazy. There's only one thing that this theory has going for it. It happens to be what the Bible teaches. And uh, I'm reminded of Richard Feynman at Caltech, and he talks about particle physics. He says that particle physics, as you get into it, is the most ridiculous theory that ever came, has ever come along in the field of physics. The only thing that has got going for it is that it's unquestionably correct. <laughs> and, and that's sort of exactly what you come out with, with this strange view. We need, I think it's, I think it's, appropriate for us to understand how weird this must sound to someone that doesn't have the background in the scripture. And it's also astonishing to many how clear it is taught in the scripture. And uh, I'm one of those extremists that even see it taught three different places in the Old Testament, let alone the New, but we won't get to that here. We talked before, we went through this, the, uh, the uh, Christian epistles, we noticed that they were in a pattern, doctrine, reproof, and correction, doctrine, reproof, and correction. We left out and left for this review the second, first and second Thessalonian epistles, because they're doctrinal. And uh, see, Romans was doctrinal but in soteriology. Ephesians was doctrinal but focusing on ecclesiology, the church. Thessalonians is doctrinal fo focusing on eschatology. 
And I left it to this hour because I wanted to focus on eschatology because this is where so many of the questions come up. So many, especially new people of the Bible, get confused with all the funny words and what, what on earth is that all about? So that's why we're about it today. The Thessalonian epistles are probably the two earliest of Paul's epistles, dated typically by some scholars in the very early uh, uh, 52 to 53 uh, AD time period. First, and they both are written from Corinth to Thessalonica. The first epistle of Thessalonians deals with our blessed hope. Both these epistles are so important to us, the short little epistles, but they both happen to deal with the key topics of eschatology. The first epistle of the Thessalonians is, speaks of our blessed hope. Now you need to understand why this letter, it's always when you read these epistles it's worthwhile trying to understand why Paul was writing the letter. And the background of the first epistle to the Thessalonians was, he was up there, he planted a church, they were all excited and he taught them um, about the second coming of Christ and so forth. And after he's gone for a while he finds that they're all upset because some of them among them have died. And they're confused because they are, apparently they may have felt that, uh, you know, that Christ's coming was coming so soon it never occurred to them. Some of them, some of their believing congregations passing away. So Paul is dealing with that issue. In his letter he first ta- talks about looking back, he talks about their exemplary conversion and how exemplary evangelism they are and how, you know, they're really a turned on church. But now looking ahead he's giving them information about comfort and he ex- What's interesting about this letter, he's reminding them of things that he, they had already been taught. And it's interesting to realize he'd only been there a few weeks. And this church, it was planted by Paul, he'd been there a few weeks, he leaves now for a year or so, he's writing a letter back reminding them of things he taught them when he was among them. So he taught them these issues during the first few weeks of their Christian experience. And so we're going to take a look at that. In um, where he hits their dilemma head on is in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians. He says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. And he goes on to explain. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. This is an event that collectively is called the first resurrection. What he's dealing with here is that the day will come when the dead in Christ will receive new bodies. And we are not, we who might be alive at that time are not going to interfere with that. He says, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. They're going to get their bodies first. Then we, which are alive and remain, in other words, we haven't died yet. This is all going on, presumably why there's some of us alive, um, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Strange thing to try to sketch on a, on a, on a, on a drawing board or something. Try to visualize this. There have been all kinds of attempts in Christian movies and stuff to render this, and it's no matter how you do it, it sounds pretty weird. But there is a, what he's saying, there is a generation that's not going to die. But the ones that have died that are in Christ will receive new bodies and we're going to ke- we will too and we'll be caught up with them in the clouds. This is the, and this is all going to happen, we're going to find out in the twinkling of an eye. And uh, not in the flink, blink of an eye, twink of an eye, less than 10 to the minus 35 centimeters, uh, uh, seconds. But anyway, um, this, is, this is the uh, Harpazzo. One of several passages on this topic. And uh, we are, shall be caught up together. The word caught up in the Greek is harpazo. In the Latin Vulgate under Jerome's translation it was rupturo, but here it's and then it translated into, uh, into, into uh, English should be caught up or snatched up. But the term in the Greek is very precise. It's to be forcibly caught up together. 
with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so, from that point on, by the way, so shall we ever be with the Lord. From that point on, we'll not be separated. And uh, there's lots of confusion because when a Christian dies, his uh, soul and spirit is with the Lord. His body decays in the grave. What kind of body does he have in the meantime? We don't know. Some people guess maybe we have a temporary body. We know he doesn't get his resurrection body until this event. So what happens between? There's all kinds of scholastic conjectures. Most of what we know about this subject comes out of Luke 16 and there's a, we've done some special briefings on that but let's just move on here. This whole event that Paul is talking about in 1 Thessalonians and he also alludes to it in 1 Corinthians 15 is a fulfillment of the promise Jesus gave them when they were in the upper room. That night he was betrayed before he gets to Gethsemane they have the famous discourse uh, in John 14 through 17 He opens that, he says, let not your heart be troubled, in John 14. Ye believe in God, believe also in me, for in in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That's pretty exciting. He left them to prepare a place for us, and he's been at it for 1900 years. We know what God did in six days. What could he do in 1900 years? I mean, I'm I'm not going to really make a parallel there, but I think it's interesting. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. There's that commitment again. Not only will it come to get us, we'll be with him from that point on. This is a little confusing. Because we think of the second coming when he comes with his armies to crush the Antichrist and all those things. How can he come with us if he says here he's coming to receive us? This is the first hint, if we're paying attention, that there's two comings involved. Most people don't realize that he's coming back twice. Once for the church and once for Israel. Different events. We'll we'll come to that. But okay. Another thing, as we get back to 1 Thessalonians, when we get to chapter 5, there's some interesting commitments that, that are often overlooked that God gives the church through Paul. Paul continues in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And I'm going to suggest to you when you read the whole passage, he's implicitly referring here to the children of the night. Just trust me for a minute, we'll come back to this. So for yourselves, you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night to those guys, is what he's in effect going to be saying here. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of the light and children of the day. Ye are not of the night or of darkness. Let us Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by the Lord Jesus. Let me go back so you get the tone of this. Paul says, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Not to everybody, to those guys is what he's saying. To the, in other words, to the children of the night. Because he goes on to say, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of the light, the children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, of, uh, the helmet, for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you, do you follow the flow of that? See, it's very important because people, he comes as a thief in the night. Yes, if he comes as a thief in the night to you, that's because you're in the you're in the night, not the day. That doesn't mean that the children of the day will know the time and the you know, day and the hour, but they will know the times and the seasons. You'll have they'll be expecting him. God t- t- teaches His own to be expecting Him. That doesn't mean you know the day and the hour. Don't misunderstand that part of it. But I want you to notice verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. 
Understand the commitment here. God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by the Lord Jesus Christ. The wrath of God will be the focus in the book of Revelation being poured out on the world. Are we there? No. And I'll show you why in several places. That's a very fundamental dispute among some scholars. And I'm, I'm, I don't want to sell you my view. I want you to be aware of the view. I want you to confirm it by your own studies. This is one, I meant to say something else about this whole hour before we started. And that at the top of your notepad, put Acts 17.11. Acts 17.11 is what Paul said about the Bereans, that they were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all openness of mind, but they searched the Scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. The Bereans were skeptical, and he encouraged that. In other words, Acts 17.11 is Luke's way of telling you don't believe anything Chuck Missler tells you, but check it out for yourself. But I'd be doing you a disservice if I don't at least share with you the views that I have gleaned from 50 years of study. Not that they're correct, but that at least you'll be aware of those views. God has not appointed us to wrath. He's speaking to the church. And the church has a, that, uh, several places that kind of commitment is very, very precious because it affects our, our perspective of the end times. Let's get to the second epistle of Thessalonians. I'll call it Our Blessed Hope Part 2. Some time goes by and Paul once again down in Corinth learns that the Thessalonians are now really upset. You need to understand why they're upset in order to understand Paul's letter here. He's answering a question. You won't understand the answer unless you know what the question was, so to speak. Um, something else you'll discover as you get into the background of the Second Thessalonians is that there was a forgery being circulated as if by Paul. And Paul is responding to this letter that is not one that he wrote. And I'll show you that in a minute. They're really upset in Thessalonica because, uh, well, that's what we want to figure out what he is. Okay, they have, They're really upset because, first of all, persecutions have begun. Up till now, the pressures on the church came from the Jewish leadership. Every place you go in the book of Acts, there's these uprisings. But it's always the Jewish leaders that are resisting the Christians. Something has changed here. Suddenly the, Ro the Romans, up till now, didn't take sides. They just wanted peace. They didn't want insurrections. But at this point we're starting to see persecution by the Romans. The Thessalonians, or Thessalonians are upset because they think the tribulation has begun. They're really shook because they're starting to get the, the abuses under Nero and all the rest. So they're upset for one of two reasons. Either they think they've missed the rapture or Paul didn't teach them properly because they think they know they have been raptured and there's persecutions going on they're really upset. That fact alone tells you the kind of teaching they must have had. They were taught not to expect the great tribulation. Doesn't say going to miss persecutions but people get those two topics confused. So Paul is going to deal with the order of events. He is going to deal with their misapprehensions. He's going to point out that what's coming is soon but not yet. And then he's going to talk about the coming challenge. Work for the night is coming and so forth. Now here's, here's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, one could argue that the second chapter, this is a little epistle of just three chapters, an opening and a closing in chapter 2. Chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians is one of the most important eschatological passages in the New Testament. Let's take a look at what Paul is saying to them. He says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that, as that the day of the Lord is at hand. The subject that is the day of the Lord is using here in a, de in, a, in a denotative sense. The day of the Lord is this time of all these cataclysmic final things. And, and they think they've entered that and they don't understand why they're not raptured. Don't be, so don't be so soon shaken by any of these things, or even by a letter as if from us. They apparently were uh, subject to some kind of forgery here. Because he's going to sign the letter in a very large hand. He's going to let them really know this one is from him. Uh, as that day of the Lord is at hand. Or by letter as from us, he says. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come 
except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The man of sin is one of 13 titles in the New Testament of the guy that we you know, casually call the Antichrist. The man of sin, the son of perdition. These are two titles that are used of, of this man of Satan, if you will. He has 33 labels in the Old Testament, 13 in the New. But this is one of the allusions here in the New Testament. But I want to talk about this falling away first. The word in the Greek is apostasia. That word can mean one of two things. It can mean a falling away of the faith, like apostasy. It can also mean the falling or catching away. You can make a competent case, if you're a Greek expert, that this term apostasia here is referring to the rapture. But I'm not going to make that case because I don't need to. I'm going to take the other view because it serves our purpose just as well. Let this simply mean a falling away. Because we certainly know from the scripture that in the end times the churches will fall away and we'll catch that in the next hour especially. So without making the hard case, which can be made if you, were, if you really want to get into the Greek technicalities, but let's set that aside. There came a way of falling away, like apostasy say, and, uh, meaning just a falling away in the, uh, uh, of faith in the church. And that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is quite a sentence. Let's look at what he's really saying. That the man of sin, the son of perdition, he's talking about the Antichrist. What is he going to do? He's going to oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God. That's quite a statement. This world leader is going to rise and he is going to exalt himself above Allah. All that is called God. He's going to exalt himself above the Pope. He's going to exalt himself above any concept of a Jewish Messiah. Take whatever you call God in the Catholic world, the Protestant world, or the the Jewish world, or the uh, Islamic world. He is going to exalt himself above all that is called God. This implicitly talks about a world religion worshiping him. He will exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. That's quite a bundle. So that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God. Really? This is one of the three places that we know that the temple is going to be standing at the end times. Because Jesus, Paul here, and John all make reference to it. Showing himself that he is God. Now here's what's the next sentence is kind of surprising. Paul says, remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things? Now wait a minute. He was with them during the first two, three weeks of their Christian experience. He went there, they got saved, and he was with them a couple of weeks. And he taught them all this stuff. This is stuff you usually don't get until you've been a Christian for some years. This is tough stuff. Paul continues. Now ye know what restraineth, or hinders, that might be revealed in this time. For the mystery of iniquity hath already worked. Only he who now restrains will restrain until he be taken out of the way. So now we have this mystery of this thing called the restrainer. What on earth is the restrainer? He restrains the mystery of iniquity. I can make a theological case that this is not an angel. This is not some force. This is not the church. There's all kinds of theories that have been advanced. This is a person. Only he who now restrains. And the Greek grammar uses, uh, implies a neuter noun. And the word for spirit is a neuter noun. So without getting into all the technicalities, I'm just going to aver here for, and let you study it on your own to find another explanation if you can find one. This is the Holy Spirit, but in a very peculiar way. The Holy Spirit will be very active all in the forthcoming period, but He is in a role today that is unique. Most of Paul's epistles are hard to understand because you don't understand how astounded he was as a Pharisaical Jew to realize the Holy Spirit was given to the believer without repentance, that that He sealed you, that He indwells you. And it's in that sense He's going to be removed. See, everybody says, well, the Holy Spirit's going to be removed from the earth. In a sense, yes, but people are going to be saved after he leaves and they are saved by him. So he's going to be active, but he's going to be active the way he was in the Old Testament. Jesus makes the remark that he had to leave so that he, the Holy Spirit, could come 
uh, in that in the unique way that he indwells the church today. There's a whole thing you got to get into there. But anyway, so in any case, this removal of the Holy Spirit is again an allusion to the rapture. And then shall the wicked one be revealed. See, this wicked one can't be revealed until after the rapture. And then shall the wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and the, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. He's there. That's a broad statement of what ultimately will happen before it's all over. The word until. Until what? Until he's taken out of the way. Then shall the wicked one be revealed. So you get that timing. It's very important. People miss that. Let's look at it another way. The whole subject is the day of the Lord, this final consummation. The day of the Lord shall not come except there be a falling away, the apostasy. That word apostasy can mean the rapture, but I'm not going to insist on that. Let's assume it just means a falling from the faith. That day, except they're falling away first, he who now restrains will restrain until he be taken out of the way. Then shall the man of sin be revealed. Do you get that order? A falling away of faith, the Holy Spirit, the rapture removed, then the man of sin's revealed, then the day of the Lord. The man of sin is the guy that defines the 70th week of Daniel. So the 70th week of Daniel can't start until the man of sin is revealed, and the man of sin can't be revealed until the rapture takes place. So the rapture occurs not just before the tribulation, before the whole 70th week of Daniel is the point. And again, don't accept it. Jot it down, do your own study, come to your own conclusions. But Paul continues, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Wait a minute. Realize what he's saying. This leader that's coming is going to work with all power and signs of lying and sign, and uh, signs and lying wonders of Satan, and with all deceivableness and of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, not a lie, the lie. Proper name, proper proper article. Def- I mean, definite article. Um, many of us have. Uh, been intrigued with the delightful fictional series developed by Tim LaHaye and his partner called Left Behind. Tim's a good friend, he's a very able guy, and J.R. Jenkins who wrote the, most of the stories is able writer. And uh, that very popular, very successful series caused many people to get interested in prophecy. There is one aspect to it that is quite controversial among theologians because the whole premise of the Left Behind series is that people who rejected Christ before the rapture have a chance afterwards. And there are good Bible scholars that may agree with that. There are also many Bible scholars who don't think that's good because uh, uh, proper because of this passage. Because this passage implies that those who rejected Christ before the rapture, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. The picture that is painted here would seem to suggest that if someone has had the opportunity to accept Christ and rejects Him, the rapture takes place, they don't really get a second chance. I'll put it another way maybe that the odds are against it because they're going to be enmeshed in the lie that follows. So the time to receive Christ is now, is the point, in any case. No, 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 no competent theologian would argue that one. But there are two views on this that I share it with you. But something else about the second coming, if you, you can collect a dozen passages, over a dozen passages, that talk about the second coming uh, as a very dramatic uh, event, obviously. You can also f- collect a group of passages that describe the rapture in very different terms. And I don't have the time to go through each one of these. I'm going to categorize them in a different way. There, are, These two groups of passages are contradictory. The group of passages that talk about the rapture I'll put in one bucket, the others, the second coming in another, and I'll call the different sentences. In the one case, you have the translation of believers only. In the second coming of Christ, there is no translation mentioned. The translation occurs before at the rapture or at the end of the thousand years. There's two different things. In the rapture, the translated saints go to heaven. In the second coming, the translated saints return to the earth. There's a difference. They're opposites, in fact. In the rapture, the earth isn't judged. In the second coming, that's the whole purpose of it. It is judged. The rapture is described as being eminent. That is, it could happen at any moment. Jesus clearly instructs us to expect Him at any time. The second coming is quite different. It follows after seven years of details that precede the second coming. 
The rapture's not in the Old Testament. I think it's hinted in a couple of places, but it's not formally there. It's certainly uh, the second coming is predicted all through the Old Testament. The rapture is believers only. The second coming affects all men on the planet Earth. The rapture occurs before the day of wrath. The second coming concludes the day of wrath. So rapture has no reference to Satan. The second coming, Satan's bound. In the rapture, Jesus comes for his own. In the second coming, he comes with his own. He comes in the air in the one case. He comes to the earth in the other. He claims his bride in the rapture. He comes with his bride in the second coming. In the rapture, only his own shall see him. Do you realize that with, when, from the crucifixion on, he was only seen by loving eyes and only handled by loving hands? Interesting. And even in the rapture, only his own will see him. In the second coming, every eye shall see him. Rapture, the tribulation begins, or shortly thereafter, and the second coming is when the millennium begins, not the tribulation. Rapture is the church only. In the second coming, there are many scholars who believe the Old Testament saved are raised after the millennium. So let's get back to this eschatology. What we've, now we've got this tribulation issue. Among those of us that are premillennial, there are three groups of variations here. And uh, there are those that believe, as I've emphasized here, that the rapture occurs before the tribulation begins. We'd call, we would call those pre-tribulational. There are others that believe that the, the, the uh, rapture occurs at the end of the seven year, seventh week of Daniel, and they're post-tribulation. We'll talk about the ones in the middle. In Matthew 24, verse 21, Jesus is responding to a private briefing to four disciples about a second coming. When he gets to verse 21, he says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was, since, was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Um, this is, Jesus here, in effect, is quoting from Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. He is labeling this period as the Great Tribulation. He gives it that very label. And uh, so the, uh, this, uh, the, 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 great, the, the Holocaust in Germany took one Jew out of three on the planet, in the planet Earth. Zechariah 13, verse 8 and 9 indicates that this next one will take two out of three. And uh, that's a very disturbing revelation. I didn't say that. Zechariah did. Chapter 13, verse 8 and 9. Great Tribulation. It gets its label from Christ's quote here. He's quoting from Daniel 12. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such was never, was never, as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall not be found, uh, everyone that shall be found uh, written in the book. And uh, in Jer- the, the, another label for this period of time is the time of Jacob's trouble. Because the focus of the Great Tribulation is worldwide, but it's on Israel. It's focusing on Israel. Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. So we have this famed seven week that we studied so much in Daniel. The la- and it's punctuated in the middle by this peculiar event called the abomination of desolation. Paul's second letter of Thessalonians talks about him setting himself up in, 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 as God in the, in the Holy of Holies. From that event to the end of the seven year period, a three and a half year period is the Great Tribulation. I want to call your attention to the fact the Great Tribulation is not seven years long, it's three and a half. People tend to use the term the Great Tribulation for the whole week. Technically, Jesus himself defines it as the last half of that week. Not a big deal, but be sensitive to the precision here. If you're going to be serious about the Bible, watch the definitions. The second coming concludes that 70th week and sets up, of course, the millennium. So far, so good. The big debate comes, okay, where does the rapture take place? People who are amillennial in the first place generally assume that the rapture or the, the, the resurrection, if you'll call it, they wouldn't call it the rapture part, but the resurrection occurs at the end of that 70th week. That's called post-tribulationalism. And there's all different kinds. Even the authors that hold those views all have different views. There's no, there isn't a single consistent view. They all have different variations because they're all dealing with allegorization of the Scripture in the first place. There's some problems with the post-trib view. It denies the teaching of eminency. If the uh, rapture doesn't occur until the end of the seven years, it can't happen tomorrow. Donald Gray Barnhouse used to kid his students when he came in the office. He said, sad day, sad day, Jesus can't come back today. Meaning that if you're post-tribulation, you've got to wait seven years at least, maybe more. 
No, the t the, clearly we're taught to expect them at any time. The post-tribulation view also requires the church to be on the earth during the 70th week, which also is con contradicted by a number of passages. The, also, the, the post-tribulational view is, uh, argues that the church will experience God's wrath, even though we were promised that it would not participate in several passages. And the other thing, how can the bride come with him if he's coming at the end of it? See, you get some contradictions. There are other problems. You get into problems, who's going to populate the millennium because the unsaved are condemned and the ones that are saved are immortal and who's populating the millennium that's going to have kids and die and so on. So there's some issues there. And where, who are the sheep and goat judgment of Matthew 25 is an issue. And how can the virgins of Matthew 25 buy oil without the mark of the beach? And you get into some, you just discover this, if you take, the, you, you, you can't hold that view and take the Bible with precision. You end up having to allegorize these things. So uh, that's the one view. The view that we lean towards, obviously, is called pre-tribulational premillennialism. We believe a literal millennium, of course, but we also believe that the rapture will occur before the tribulation. Um, but what we mean by that, we actually believe it's not only is it before the tribulation, it's before the seventh week even begins. I want you to notice, now there are, oh, there are some people that recognize the tribulation is technically just that last half of the week. So they believe they'll be raptured by the middle of the week, still before the tribulation, but in the middle of the seventh week of Daniel. And uh, Rosenthal, pre, so-called pre-wrath, there's a number of positions that are variations of that. They all have the same problem, they all deny imminency. Anything that requires you to be in or any part of that week means it can't happen tomorrow. And yet we're told again and again the doctrine of imminency implies that Jesus can come for us at any moment. And that's clearly what he taught us. And so all these other views are contra contradict that issue. But I want you to know something else. We don't put our little arrow up at the beginning of the seventh week. Some people make charts a little sloppily. We don't know what the interval of time is between the time the rapture takes place and the time that the Antichrist gets revealed, becomes powerful enough to enforce a treaty, and then enforces a treaty with Israel for seven years. That could be one day, it could be 30 years, we have no idea. So there's an interval. I don't know how long. It might be measured in hours or months or years between the rapture and the beginning of the seventh week of Daniel. It probably isn't long for lots of reasons, but there is an interval as, as we see it. So the rapture precedes the tribulation because the seventh week is defined by the covenant enforced by the leader. The Great Tribulation the last half of that week. The leader cannot be revealed until after the rapture. So that's, that's, that's the buildup of that timing, if you will. If you really verify this for yourself in your studies, it will clear, clarify, a, lift a great deal of confusion that tends to occupy this area of study. Again, the order of events. The day of the Lord can't come until the apostasia, whatever that is, which in turn, then the restrainer is removed. In any case, and the man of sin is revealed, which is all before the seventh week of Daniel. You with me? Therefore before the tribulation. Okay, so we've talked about those, the different portions of, of eschatology. We've talked about the pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib. People who have, uh, the, the amillennial post-trib co accommodates most denominations have inherited that from the medieval church originally. Most of us that are fundamentalists take the Bible very literally, fall on the other end. Uh, we're typically premillennial, pre-tribulational in our, in our viewpoints. There, therein lies the, 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 the map, if you will, of, of eschatological views. From allegorical to literal. Depends what your hermeneutics are. Now many people say pre-tribulation is a, a new invention. That's not true. It's written in the Epistle of Barnabas in the first century. Irenaeus in his treatise against heresies. Hippolytus in the second century. Just martyr, the early church fathers. One of the most interesting documents was just discovered a few years ago by Ephraim the Syrian. Most of us inherit our understanding of the church history from the Western church, Western Europe. You need to remember that the Eastern tradition goes deeper and longer by a thousand years. The, the, Greek, uh, the, uh, the, the Greek traditions. The, uh, uh, and uh, one of the most prolific writers in the Greek tradition was a guy by the name of Ephraim the Syrian, wrote in the fourth century. And uh, he wrote one of his, one, most of his stuff has never been translated from Greek to English. In one of his sermons, the title of which was on the last times, the Antichrist and the end of the world, in one of his sermons, he, this is, we're talking guy now, for, this is fourth century. He says, for all the saints and the elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation that is to come and are taken to the Lord lest they see the confusion that is to overwhelm the world because of our sins. This is a pre-trib position. 
taught uh, way back in the early Greek church. Uh, we also, you can go all through the ancient uh, commentaries. This is not a new idea. There are people opposed to this view that try to promote the idea it was invented in the early 1800s. That's not true. What did happen in the 1800s, a guy by the name of Emmanuel Lacunza uh, popularized this. A guy by the name of Edward Irving and John Darby and Margaret MacDonald followed suit. And they were, there was a, a big revival and an emphasis on this view. But you'll actually, if you do your homework in terms of church history, you'll discover these views were held by a minority from the beginning all through history. They're the ones that are typically abused by the denominational interests, whether they're Catholic or Protestant. But something else, standing away from all this, you realize there are three groups of people facing the judgment called the flood of Noah. Those that perished in the flood, of course, is one group. Those that were preserved through the flood, the eight people on that ark. And there's a third group, those that were removed prior to the flood. Enoch, remember? Now you say, well, Chuck, that's just one person. So is the body of Christ one person. Paul emphasized that we are one body and so forth. So idiomatically, at least, we are one. So I'm, I'm very fascinated by this um, because I want to suggest to you that Enoch was not mid-flood or post-flood. He was pre-flood. Okay. <laughs> okay. But what's interesting, I've stumbled on something that fascinates me. In the, among the rabbinical traditions, they believe that Enoch was born on the day that they happened to observe Hag Shavuot. He also, the tradition they have from some ancient rabbinical writings is that Enoch was translated, or if I can say that, use the term raptured, on that same day. In other words, he was translated on his birthday. What makes this provocative to me, Hag Shavuot is the Hebrew term for what we would call the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost. That was when the church was born in Acts chapter 2. And I can't resist speculating or conjecturing. Is it possible that if Enoch is a type of the church, is it possible that the church also will be translated on its birthday. I don't know. Now I don't want to set dates, don't start doing that to me. But Because Jesus said, the day you think not, the Son of Man cometh. But if that's the day you think not, then that's maybe the day you'll come. Right? <laughs> okay. Stay away from date setters. We could, it's astonishing to make a chronicle of the people who have set dates way back in the 13th century on. And I won't go through all these. I mentioned John Napier was one of them back in the 17th century, and many others. William Whitson said it was going to, he's coming back in 1715, then he decided it was 1734, and then he moved it out to 1866, which I'm sure was beyond his retirement age. Um, <laughs> uh, and then uh, William Miller, 1843, then he decided it was October 22nd, 1844, C.T. Russell, 1874. Remember E.C. E. Wisenant's, 88 Reasons for 88. If you have any of those old books, save them, they'll be collector's items. Uh, Harold Camping, and it was sure it was September 1994. And of course, since we passed the year 2000, you can you know, all kinds of people are going to waltz out charts or formulas and whatever. And, and uh, uh, the date setters are always there. Let's just look what the scripture says. Of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Matthew goes on, watch therefore, for ye know not what hour the Lord doth come. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. You'd think that the point would be made, we don't set dates, right? We, times and seasons, sure, but not dates. We don't set dates. Luke says, for therefore be ready also for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Indeed, indeed. He said unto them, it is not for you to know the times and seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. There's another disease that I think is primarily American. This is a malady, a, a, a mania, a de mental derangement that occurs primarily in the United States. I call it rapture-itis. Uh, there is a, a, a tendency by people who get caught up in this rapture to see him just around the corner. And that's fine. That God tells us to expect him any moment. But they also, what they end up doing is putting their feet on the desk and kicking back and say, boy, he's coming from a week from Tuesday. Why pay off that mortgage? Why send our kids to college? He's coming back soon. And um, uh, you know, many of those Teenagers that came off the drug scene in the early 70s are now pastors of churches and uh, handing the churches over to their sons because time has slipped by, if you haven't noticed. There, this idea that somehow uh, 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 we're not going to be facing... First of all, it's a question of stewardship. Jesus said, occupy till I come. So it's a question of stewardship. But it's also, we need to have an expectation of persecution. Jesus promised this persecution. Don't confuse persecution with that particular period of time called the Great Tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. 
And uh, this is a form of arrogance. Just because I think I can prove to you the church will not go through the Great Tribulation, why should we, as Americans, say, escape what most of the body of Christ in most of the world for most of the 2,000 years that have passed had to endure? Not the Great Tribulation, it's just persecution. Christ promised it to us. And indeed, we can expect that. Yes, and here in America. It's been predicted by some scholars that not only will the real body of Christ have to go underground in America, it's the persecution against it will be led by the denominational churches. That sounds preposterous at first. It certainly did, I'm sure, 20 years ago when J. Vernon McGee first announced that. But the more you watch the tide of our culture and the use of hate crimes, um, these Christians in Philadelphia that were attacked and discovered that 10% of the attorneys in the federal government are, are, are homosexuals. And uh, uh, when you examine what they did, all they were doing they were, you know, is, is reading from the scripture in public. And uh, they're facing uh, judicial process around right, right, at this point. If you want to, what time it is, of course, you look at God's timepiece. But there are other issues we haven't had time to look at. Um, the rise of the European super state, we didn't take a look at that, but we did when we were in Daniel. The rise of the Far East. The, the refuge in Edom where he, the Jews will flee from Jerusalem when the Antichrist does his thing. The battle of Armageddon we have in detail. We'll talk about that somewhat in the next hour or in the, uh, in the hour after next. The Magog invasion, the rebuilding of the temple, and the rebuilding of Babylon. These last three things are in effect topics that should be touched upon in a review of eschatology. Let's just take a quick look at now. We've talked about the Magog invasion how that the battle of Armageddon is at the end of the 70th week of Daniel. We talked about that before. And uh, we know that the temple will be standing by the middle of that week because Pe- uh, Peter, uh, I mean, excuse me, uh, James, Paul, and uh, uh, Jesus all talk about it. The, the, the Magog invasion of Ezekiel 38 we talked about, it's classically viewed as occurring at the end of the uh, tribulation by Hal Lindsey and, and other very competent scholars on the one hand, but there are many of us that have a slightly different view. We think the Magog invasion occurs before the 70th week and uh, for a number of technical reasons. So there's that debate. But what I bring it up primarily for this reason, what we all agree on is the Magog invasion d- does occur after the rapture of the church. So to the extent the Magog invasion seems to be on a horizon and many experts uh, in the strategic arena, I believe so, uh, then uh, that means the rapture is even closer. So that's pretty exciting. And we could talk more on that, but let's move on. The coming temple. Jesus mentioned it in Matthew 24, Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 we saw, John will mention it when we get to Revelation 11. The rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. This is just of course a model of the, how they think it was reconstructed at one time. Here's an aerial photograph of the region taken from the north west looking southeast. The Dome of the Rock the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and the western wall between, you know, on the, on the side there, and, uh, which is often photographed where they go to pray and so on. Um, this, is the, this is actually, it's, not the, it's just the retaining wall that held the temple area. If you go up to the temple area, you'd go up on a right through the Maghrabi Gate and onto the, onto the platform. Um, here's an aerial view of the Temple Mount with north at the top and uh, we have the traditional view is that the, the original temple stood where the Dome of the Rock stands today. That is the official view of the, the nation of Israel, but it's not the view of the scientists that have studied this carefully. Uh, there is a northern conjecture popularized by Dr. Asher Kaufman. He's a good friend. Chuck Smith and I funded his original research. Uh, he has a number of reasons why he believes that the uh, uh, temple stood about 100 meters to the north of the Dome of the Rock. There's a number of reasons he defends that view. It may, what caused a big stir many decades ago in this first surface is that would put the Dome of the Rock um, in that region called the uh, Court of the Gentiles. And that complies in a sense with the passages that we'll encounter in Revelation 11. That created quite a stir. However, there are some problems remaining. If you try to create a three-dimensional model of the temple area, you run into some problems because there's a some, if you take the Joseph, Joseph, the Tesefta, the Mishnah, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and uh, 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 Josephus and a few other things, and try to put that together. Agrippa had a view of the Azara, the place where they offered uh, that just just doesn't work. The Romans could also see from the wall what was going on in the Azara. Azara is that part of the temple where they did the offerings, and you can't. It just doesn't work three dimensionally. There's also a water aqueduct, parts of which are still in place, 
that fed the temple and it implies if the, if the temple stood at the Dome of the Rock it's 21 meters too high. It would have to be further south at lower elevation because the, the, the bedrock drops going south. And the, There's also a location of a moat issue and anyway the, all, when you start looking at these carefully uh, it implies that the, the temple stood south of the Dome of the Rock. Now you need to understand a little history here. In 70 AD of course Jerusalem fell. In 132 AD Bar Kokhba had his ill-fated revolt and uh, it took the Romans about three years to get their act together. He, he actually had wiped out the 12th legion, something they never recovered from, but the Romans finally get their act together, they regain Jerusalem, but by then Hadrian, Emperor Hadrian, decides they can never re- rule that land as long as there's a Jewish present in Jerusalem. So they, they bury the entire city, plow it under, build a Roman city on top of it called Aela Capitolina, named after Hadrian's, and uh, then uh, a temple to Jupiter was built over the site of the Jewish temple. And, and uh, from Jerome's commentary on Isaiah we know there was an equestrian statue of Hadrian installed right over the Holy of Holies. Well the question is where did the, was this temple built? Well we don't know but uh, some architects in Tel Aviv noticed something very strange. They noticed that the Dome of the Rock, the Alcaz Fountain and the Aqsa Mosque are on a center line. And that applies to an architect, a plan of some kind, a vestige of something that stood there earlier. Tuvia Segev is the main champion of this, also a good friend. Um, up in Baalbek, Lebanon, the, the uh, Romans built a temple and uh, as people who study how the, how the uh, Romans built temples, they had an architectural pattern, this looked better from the top, they had a temple, a rectangular temple, a courtyard, and then a polygon or circular structure called a rotunda at the other end and uh, they put their, their statues and stuff in, the, in this uh, courtyard in between. If you take the temple at Baalbek exactly as it's sitting there. It is built around a hexagon, not an octagon, but other than that, if you take that, go to the uh, the, the, the Aila Capitol or, or Jerusalem and put it there, it fits perfectly, the, uh, the, the situation that's there. The al Mosque has been rebuilt six times due to earthquake damage, it's not exactly the same size anymore. The Dome of the Rock is an octagon, not a hexagon. But other than that, it fits perfectly. And that implies then that the temple, that the, the uh, right over the uh, statue of Hadrian would be, was, is over the Alcaz fountain which is stating there. So that there seems to be increasing evidence that that's the correct conjecture. So this, this temple was, in Jerusalem was built by the same guy who built the one in Lebanon about the same time. And so Hadrian's statue is right over the Holy of Holies it would seem and so we think we know where that is. And so this is the, what I'll call the southern conjecture. The traditional view is in the middle and Asher Calvin's view is the north. So we've got these three different views that uh, will only be resolved if we can get good access and uh, take care of it. This is an infrared photograph flying over the Dome of the Rock and we notice a pentagonal structure underneath it which implies that it was part of the Antonia Fortress by the way. To give you a long, a long answer to this in a quick. Um, if you take an infrared f- profile of the wall from Mount of Olives we notice a couple of interesting things. You notice uh, the place there is a, the, where the Golden Gate, the so-called Eastern Gate is, there really isn't. There's a one first century gate there, but down where the temple is, there is behind that wall infrared evidence of another entrance. So that's the the, the red rock falls for, f- uh, far enough that you could build the temple to where it originally stood without touching the Temple Mount because it's low enough in altitude. Now I'm not suggesting I do this; it's just one proposal that is kind of interesting to throw up. Okay. One other thing I'd like to profile quickly for you, we studied Babylon when we were in Isaiah 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 15 and 51. That it would never again be inhabited after it's destroyed and, and uh, building material is not reused. This is a picture of Babylon today. Here's an aerial photograph. This is a city 55 miles south of Baghdad. Um, and uh, in this aerial photograph you can see Saddam Hussein's palace that is prominent, the, the original rubble of the Tower of Babel. And if you blow that region up larger you can see the processional way and the um, original um, palace of Nebuchadnezzar and when you blow that up it's uh, been rebuilt. Not completely but it's substan- it implies that it is yet to, re- to re-emerge to prominence in order to receive the judgment that occurs in Isaiah 13 and Jeremiah 50. So um, this is interesting because it's on our horizon today. There are many people who think this is silliness all we need to do is sit back and watch. Do your homework and see what happens. The museum where Nebuchadnezzar had the, the, you know, the, the uh, things he took from the 
Jerusalem seven years earlier before Belshazzar had his party and you know the story. Okay, the challenge. You and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. That's our preposterous challenge. To challenge a statement, I ask you to do two things. Find out what the Bible says and find out what is really going on. The more you know about both of those, the more you'll see a concurrence. We monitor strategic trends. We publish a news journal and I have a website that tries to monitor strategic trends. These are a few of them, the primary ones. They're all biblically relevant. They're also areas of intelligence gathering in terms of the changes occurring on our immediate horizon. It isn't any one of them, it's all of them that orchestrate the view that we're moving to an an exciting horizon. And uh, so with that, let's do two things. Study your Bible and make the effort to find out what's really happening. And you won't do that on the 10 o'clock news. You've got to do a little homework. But with the internet and alternative press and other resources available to you, it's not hard to find out what's happening. But the more you know what's happening, the more exciting it is because we are moving into the final climax of human history. God bless you.